I would like to hear your opinion on the recent interviews John Moxley, formerly Dean Ambrose, has been doing since debuting at AEW's Double or Nothing pay-per-view, where he's criticizing slash breaking down the current WWE creative process. Do you agree or disagree? Thank you. I haven't heard any of them. Have you read any of the transcripts? <laughs> they're really going to make the shortest answer possible. No, they really are um, fascinating interviews. No, actually, I did read one about he was on with Jericho, and I read some of the transcript to some of that, and and I can see, you know, the 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 only thing is I can also see from some of the things he said, the ages, and no, you can't bring in the goddamn, you know, fire engine locomotive and fucking three tables and a chair and erect a goddamn high school shop class project on some of his ideas. I'm sure he had, or whatever. I could see a little bit of that, but at the same time, a lot of it was, you know, yes. And, and Vince's Jedi mind trick. I, I just never knew how to phrase it before, but that's been a thing ever since I've fucking known him. You will go in to a conversation with him specifically wanting to do one thing and fuck it, I'm going to do it. And by the time you leave, you'll understand why that's the stupidest thing you could have ever fucking done. And I don't know how he fucking does it. Has but, he done it to yeah, you? But, oh yeah. You have an example? <laughs> Um, we, we were going to do the goddamn, uh, the Jerry Springer show one time before everybody knew it was a work. They had contacted us. I was going to get some fucking attention for Smoky Mountain Wrestling one way or the other, right? Um, they wanted to do Tracy Smothers and Bullet Bob Armstrong and the gangsters and the dirty white boy. And they thought it was going to be some kind of fucking racial thing, right? And, uh, but we were going to goddamn go on the Jerry Springer show and shoot a fucking angle. And get violent amongst the fucking uh, baby faces and the heels when the gangsters were there. But that weekend that we were going to do it the following week was when Undertaker came to work Freedom Hall in Johnson City and in the six man against the the gangsters. And and he heard about it in the I guess somebody talking about it in the locker room. And I swear to God, if I did not get a call from Vince, I don't think you should do that because I was on their TV, too. And I don't even remember why or how he talked me out of it. Otherwise, and I wasn't looking forward to driving to Chicago, which I was going to do two days later. But we were going to shoot some kind of angle to try to get Smoky Mountain some attention. And by the time that he got finished, oh, that's the last thing we want to do is be on Cherry Spring. <laughs> <laughs> and so I called him and said, no, nah, we're not going to do it. And they're like, oh, fuck. And, well, Vince don't want us to. I put the heat on him. Uh, but yeah, it, it, whatever it is. I mean, it, and then it... Sometimes every once in a while it worked in reverse. I remember one time I was on a creative team and they had nothing for Fatu. Had, n had no spot for Fatu. And and they were going to, I think they'd made him the Sultan and that didn't work or whatever. And they and so Vince said, I'm, I'm going to have to call him in and let him go. Okay, figure him out. When you're doing cards, whatever. Okay. So he called him in. The, that was when Fatu and Afa and got two more members of the family and I can't one was Rosie and what I don't even know but they came to the meeting with Fatu and by the time that they left Vince's office he had re-signed Fatu and signed the other three of them <laughs> and then he came back and he said oh yeah no we're gonna do this and that I forget what we fucking did but he you know instead of firing one guy he hired the other three so you never knew. Uh, we told the story about the fake razor and diesel. You know, I'm, I'm on the creative team writing the shows and I'm gone for two days and I hear about it from it's announced on the live television on Saturday morning. It, you, you never knew what he was going to fucking do. So back to this Moxley interview, um, based on what you read, the transcript from the Jericho interview, any thoughts? Well, yeah, like I said, you know, it, it's frustrating and especially, I've never worked with this guy, so I don't know whether his ideas are good or full of fucking horse shit. With the oomph that he has and the fact that he's gotten over to the level he's gotten over, he's probably got some good shit. But that's uh, another part of the problem is, is that Vince sees you a different way than the people see you. For example, I saw Billy Gunn the other night at the baseball game, and he was asked a question at the Q&A about the, the rockabilly Vince in 1996, and I, and I love Wayne Ferris. I've known Wayne Ferris since 1978, the honky-tonk man. 
But Vince, in 1996, thought that Billy Gunn was a good athlete. He just didn't have any personality. So he'll put him with the Honky Talk Man because Honky's over so Honky can get it. The 1996 audience did not want to see Honky Tonk Man as a manager of Rockabilly or anybody else, and Rockabilly just looked like a fucking goon. But Vince loved it until everybody shit on it, and then he gave up on it, which is the reason why that Rockabilly was, you know, engaging in opening matches, trading wins and losses with Road Dog Jesse James because uh, Jeff Jarrett had gone, he was on the outs, Vince mad at him, so his his road dog, who had all the talent in the world, suddenly ah fuck him. <laughs> he was like, let him, we'll let him work with Rockabilly, and he just gave up on both of them. So then they got the chance to just go out and play and do their own shit because they didn't care, couldn't get any worse, and that's when they got over. So it, it, yes, Vince, it doesn't matter how the people see you. It's how Vince sees you. And if he thinks if, if you were over at one time and in his mind you're still over, he will let you do whatever you want. But if you weren't over and drawing money specifically the last time he remembers when they did and you're newer that he doesn't think you're over no matter whether you're over or not. I don't know how to explain it. it it's, it's just the way Vince sees everything. Well, you know, part of the interview and he did another interview. And, and, if, and, if, and if you ain't over, he ain't going to let you do anything that you want to. One of the things he talked about is the fact that it's a little different now than from when you were there because you have all of these script writers and their number one goal is making sure Vince is happy and what Vince wants changes, you know, based on whenever he wakes up from his nap. Yeah. Uh, he may not know he's taking a nap when he's taking a nap sometimes. But, you know, the idea that he hands a guy like Dean Ambrose, John Moxley, a script and it's filled with really bad, cheesy dialogue. You understand this part, I know, the the part where... Guys are being given a script that doesn't make sense for them. Yes. Words that it just doesn't, it would never come out of their mouths and they're told to make this your own and it's awful stuff. But <laughs> Vince will then insist, oh, it's such good shit. It's such good shit. And you realize the whole show is being written for Vince and it's worse now than it's ever been. The show and, and Vince, quite frankly. I mean, what, what do you think in terms of when, when WCW started stealing guys and it was a back and forth, Vince was younger, Vince was able to adapt to the times. Do you see any signs that Vince would be able to adapt this time? Uh, I mean, if he was going to do it, he'd probably done it by now, except if, you know, and, and here's the thing. That's another reason why I didn't like fucking AEW Battle Royal. And I'll tell you why. It's because I could see Vince and Kevin Dunn and, and Triple H and a, a variety of other big wigs and fat cats or head honchos or big cheeses or whatever in the WWE sitting in a room. I don't, I'm not saying that they did this, that they all had a viewing party, but I can see them watching it somewhere on their own, at least watching that battle Royal going ah, and laughing and say, we knew it. It's going to be outlaw bullshit. It is it, as, as hard as it was to take, Watching it as a wrestling fan with uh, what the fuck, another fucking outlaw bullshit mud show. It was worse thinking that the WWE head honchos are up there going, okay, we don't have anything to worry about as far as the professionalism of, uh, uh, even though they do stupid hokey shit too, <clears throat> at least they're not going to have the legless guy and a blah, blah, blah. And it also they're going to have experienced announcers that are bad instead of inexperienced, inexperienced announcers that are bad. They're going to have professional talent. That's known worldwide doing stupid shit instead of fucking outlaw guys that are known unknown worldwide doing stupid shit. It's they're still going to be in their minds because they looked at the level of professionalism of the, the whole thing and said, we got nothing to worry about, and laughed, and that was a disservice. Uh, at some point, if they feel that somebody is a threat, then Vince may be able to change or adapt or whatever. But ex besides for the amount of money being thrown around, they do not see AEW based on that program, I can tell you. They don't see AEW as a threat based on that program, based on the money being offered to people that they might like to have work for them. That may be another story, but now they're laughing because they think, okay, they're going to spend themselves out quick doing stupid shit like this and signing fucking clowns like this. 
So actually, I think after Double or Nothing, if the truth is told, Vince, Kevin Dunn, and a few of the fucking people who most control things are worried less about them than they were before the fucking show. Interesting. I had not heard anyone else say that. That's because, I mean, obviously, apparently it did a good buy rate. And other than yeah, the Battle the, Royal, there is some stuff that people are raving about. Dustin versus Cody. The well, Bucks yes. Was a, you know, a good Young Bucks match. Jericho may not be what Jericho wants. Well, wait, wait, wait. A, a, good, a good Young Bucks match. For a Young Bucks match, it was a good uh, match. All right. Well, I, you know, for being a nice guy in prison. No, but, but in all honesty, I can see. And once again, because of the money. A buy rate of a hundred thousand on pay per view. Uh, let's see if they go anywhere when they get television, or let's see when the the next time they run if they hold that number. There was a lot of curiosity about this, and we've seen from Twitter all of the diehard hardcore play wrestler fans, etc. But I'm talking about Vince McMahon watching that program, or Kevin Dunn watching that program, or some of the uh, Stephanie or anybody watching and saying, "Ha ha ha! This is an unprofessional bunch of bullshit." They obviously still want to be worried because the guy's a billionaire and he's got plenty of money and he might sign some people away or force them to pay more money for people. And I'm sure they're pissed off about that. Well, his dad is a billionaire. It's just so well, much. regardless, it's a billion. There's a, a billionaire's uh, finances are being involved in this. Yeah. But the point is, what they did was they got they they let. Vince and the fucking honchos get a moral victory by being able to look at that like I did and say, ah, ha, ha, when it comes to push comes to shove, they're going to be producing outlaw bullshit. They won't last. I am guarantee you I know these people. That's what they were fucking thinking. So you don't think WWE sees them as a threat right now? No, I'm saying, yes, they see them as a threat, especially financially, but they see it a lot less after they got a chuckle at them putting on a fucking amateur hour television production. This point I'm making. They 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 actually let Vince Vince McMahon have a little snicker at them by putting on unprepared announcers and using outlaw talent, and it not being a smooth show up to the par that he believes. And of course, Kevin Dunn will be sitting right there telling him the same thing. So if they'd had a blow away show on everybody's part, and especially have Jr. there to fucking be the lead announcer. Uh, they could have rubbed Vince's face in some shit. Instead, they probably, I know these people, they are sitting there amongst themselves saying, well, look at this outlaw shit. They won't last long like that. And they're trying to fucking make themselves feel better about it. Instead of sitting there going, holy shit, that was fucking wow.